Thank you guys for tuning in and welcome to another episode of The Source, where we interview whistleblowers or investigative journalists or policy experts. I'm your host, Zain Raza, and today we'll be talking to author, economist, and the co-founder of Democracy at Work, Richard Wolf. Richard, glad to have you back on, and I will start with you in German, just because I know you speak German. Wie geht es dir? Ganz gut, vielen Dank, und ich hoffe, dass das interessant heute ist. Let us get back to English. How are you holding up during this crisis and what is the general atmosphere in New York? Well, New York in the United States is what we call here the epicenter. That is, it's a uh, it's the most intense place in the country, um, partly because it is a highly condensed city. It is concentrated in relatively little bit of land. And so uh, because the country was terribly unprepared for the crisis uh, and because the government did not act until very late, mid-March, um, by the time the American response to COVID got underway, it was already too late for New York. So for example, I would guess uh, maybe 10 to 20 percent of the city of New York, uh, the population left the city uh, to be out of the city because it was too dangerous. So the country is very frightened. The unemployment, uh, because this country doesn't deal with uh, the employment problem very well, mostly people are fired. They are, lose their job, they lose their income. And so you have basically the, the trauma of a viral pandemic, and now on top of it, a collapse of the economy, uh, the likes of which we have never seen, and the constant comparison is with the Great Depression of the 1930s. So it is as extreme a crisis of, for the United States um, as we have had in many, many years. And that only underlines the fact that our government is more incompetent and crazy than it has been. Uh, and so we are at a very difficult time with a very poor leadership. What would be interesting for our Europeans viewers to know is the state of the US healthcare system and whether it was ready to combat this crisis. I mean, you've already talked about it a little bit right now, but could you provide us some context of the US healthcare system before you can talk about uh, whether it will survive uh, this crisis during this time now? Well, the health system has been, uh, the best word we use here is it has been shrunken. It has been made much smaller over recent years basically because it worked under a profit system. In other words, hospitals were increasingly purchased and operated as profit-making enterprises. And therefore, whether or not you built a hospital or whether or not you produced a bed or whether or not you stockpile medicine was all calculated in terms of the profit rate. And so, for example, we close many, many hospitals in the United States, both urban and rural, over the last 30 years. Um, and we tighten the whole medical establishment. Uh, you know we are the only country in the world, advanced industrial country, that does not have, still does not have, a national health uh, insurance system. Uh, we spend more money per person on health care than any other country in the world. Uh, but you could see already the difficulties because in the three years before the virus, the life expectancy in the United States for the first time in a century uh, fell. In other words, people were living shorter lives because of uh, the kinds of difficulty. We also had major health crises before the virus that I also don't think have an equal elsewhere in the world. I'll give you an example. We have seen over half a million people 
uh, killed themselves with overdose of opioid drugs, above all OxyContin and drugs like that. Uh, for the last five years, we have seen an epidemic of um, overdose, and, and the line between overdose and suicide is very difficult um, to pinpoint, but it's clearly a health problem, part physical, part mental. Uh, so I would say we've had a health system that has been in greater and greater difficulty, and so that's part of why it was so badly unprepared for the coronavirus. Right-wing economists, or I would say neoliberal economists, would argue that the government intervention, especially under Obama, via Obamacare, created a system of false incentives, crowding out private investment in healthcare and thereby creating these conditions. Um, the example that they were usually quote is, look at Italy, look at France and Spain, who have a governmental healthcare system, and yet were unable to cope with the crisis. What is your take on this perspective? Well, I think it's a, a perfectly reasonable thing to point uh, to the uh, national health care systems uh, if indeed they failed also. Uh, I would suggest, however, that if you wanted to explain why the United States has now become the number one country for uh, corona deaths, and the number one country for the number of cases. And let me remind you, we have not even tested one half of 1% of the American people as I am speaking to you, So, because we have failed in the testing as well. So we don't know. And I think that the reason the United States is worse than most other countries is in part because we don't have even the kind of national health care that does exist in France or Germany or Italy uh, or Spain and so on. In other words, a national health care system isn't a guarantee, but it is a better way to approach this than the United States. And I think that's now uh, clear. I could go further and argue that the degree to which the, the public health is managed by the government as a social service, with or without a national health, that will determine how successful you are in being ready for a pandemic like this. And I should remind you all, we have viral pandemics all the time. Viruses are part of nature. We have had them. SARS, MERS, Ebola in recent years, the Spanish flu in 1918, which killed huge numbers of people. There is no excuse for not being prepared. And the fundamental problem is that even in countries like Germany or France or England, to the degree that you allow the production and stockpiling of medicine to be handled and controlled by profit-driven companies, you will be unprepared, not only for the corona, but for any of the future viruses that we know will periodically appear. I want to talk about the role of billionaires, such as Bill Gates at the moment. Uh, for example, Bill Gates appeared on German television as an expert uh, on primetime. Millions of people watched it. And he's now the go-to guy to uh, advise, for example, our main medical institution that is at the forefront called the Robert Koch Institute. How do you view the expert opinion of people like Bill Gates? He's had a huge sway um, by holding stocks on pharmaceutical companies and uh, also developing vaccines and on the WHO, the World Health Organization. Are these the people that we should be looking up to for expert advice? And um, are billionaires in a position to now comment on this crisis? Well, I, I'm not personally familiar with whatever credentials uh, Bill Gates has to be speaking on health care. It is crystal clear to me that the only reason you and I speak about Bill Gates is because of the money he has, not because of his insight into medical or any other topic. Uh, 
the way to understand Bill Gates is to remember the wonderful movie by the British comedian uh, Peter Sellers. And the movie was called Being There. Uh, if you are the right person at the right time, in the absurd irrationality of capitalism, you get all the money. Even though thousands of people contributed this piece of information, that piece of information, even though your teachers prepared you for whatever you did, um, somehow, if you're the right person at the right time, you get all the money. And because he has money, people listen to him. It, it is no compliment to the German uh, society that they pay so much attention to a person who has so much money. Uh, he has decided as an act of charity to give some of his money to health. And this has purchased for him a prestigious position as a quote unquote expert on health. It's really a testimony that with the amount of money that he has, you can buy pretty much whatever position in society you wish. So we have one billionaire is president of the United States, and the other billionaire is building rocket ships to take him to the moon. And Mr. Gates is a billionaire who has decided to become uh, a person on health. Uh, but I think it's pathetic that we, we have an army of highly qualified doctors and medical researchers, they're the ones that ought to be advising us on what to do. There is no need to add uh, a billionaire who has read a few articles uh, and put him in such a position. It's, it's a sign of the slavishness of a capitalist system to those who have been in the right place at the right time to control the money. You also mentioned something called the medical industrial complex. Just briefly, could you talk about what that is and how it could be related to the coronavirus? Very simple. The medical industrial complex here in the United States is a term we use borrowed from what was also called the military industrial complex. Uh, it's when a group of industries get together And rather than each one of them being a monopoly, they create a monopoly as a collective effort. So in the case of the medical industrial complex, it's four industries. Doctors, that's one. Hospitals, that's two. Drug and device makers, that's three. And medical insurance companies, that's four. Those four have gotten together Each one supports the other one in achieving a monopoly position. So, for example, we do not train more than a certain number of doctors so that doctors are the supply of doctors is small relative to the demand, which is why doctors get paid much more money in the United States than they do in most other countries. The same is true of hospitals. The same is true of drugs. If you put it all together, uh, the statistics show that in the United States, medical care costs 50 to 100 percent more than in other industrial countries. We spend about 18 to 19 percent of the GDP of the United States for medical care. In most other advanced countries, the number is half of that or less. Uh, meanwhile, we are not healthier than other people. We are dying at a younger age. We have uh, serious diseases of all kinds that we have not eradicated, alcoholism, opioid addiction, all kinds of drug addiction that are epidemics in the country. So our medical outcomes are mediocre, but the amount of money we spend on medical care is the highest in the world. That is a sign of a monopoly, and the medical industrial complex has accomplished that monopoly. 
You talked about being in the right moment at the right time in terms of Bill Gates and you just mentioned doctors as well. Uh, I could imagine that the liberal or even neoliberal argument would be, well, yes, he was at the right moment in time, but he, as compared to other people who were in the right moment in time, did the best of opportunities. And usually when I talk to doctors, uh, they say, hey, I have a right to all of this wealth. Uh, and to even accumulate more wealth like other billionaires and millionaires because I put eight years of my life going into the study, sacrificing every day, whereas other people were not doing and availing these best opportunities. I suffered tremendously psychologically to be able to get this. And if other people have done better than me, they should become billionaires. So how do you view this liberal or even, let's say, uh, neoliberal perspective? Well, I'm not surprised that people who earn a lot of money have developed an ideology that suggests that the world is better off because they are unusually rich. Uh, th this is as old as the human race. Uh, I don't find this very persuasive. If you want people to do something that takes eight years of education, then pay for the education because it's socially useful. It had, to have a doctor trained is a social decision. It has nothing to do with the individual uh, who decides to go into that field as opposed to spending four to eight years learning something else, like how to play a beautiful musical instrument or how to become an effective teacher or a thousand other things. You know, I could list here 25 different things that take five or eight years of effort. We produce it, but we don't pay those people anything like that amount of money. It takes eight years to be a great musician or to be a great actress or to be a great painter. We give those people either a great deal of money or no money at all. There is no relationship between the amount of money you have and the work that you do. Uh, let me give you a starker example. The richest person in the United States is Jeffrey Bezos. He has somewhere in the neighborhood of $150 billion. Tens of thousands, or excuse me now, hundreds of thousands of people work in the warehouses of Amazon earning $10 an hour. They do the work, but Mr. Bezos disposes of an amount of money that no sane person would ever justify on the grounds that the work of Mr. Bezos is that valued at 150 billion and the work of the person sweating in the Amazon warehouse is worth $10 an hour. That's crazy. And the attempt to, to, to justify that means that you are so insecure in the income you earn and rightly so, that you have to come up with the most far-fetched, crazy ideas. One, here's another way to get at it. In ancient Egypt, Pharaoh had the amount of money that Mr. Bezos did. But you know something? The Pharaoh didn't think of the argument your doctor gave you. The Pharaoh didn't think it would make sense to say he worked harder than other people since one ten one day's observing of his life indicated he didn't work at all. So he had to come up with a different explanation. His explanation was that God had chosen him to be the Pharaoh. And you know something? There is a greater honesty in that craziness than in the effort in modern culture, which is so focused on labor, to try to tell the person working for you for $10 an hour that the reason that person can't have a decent life is in order that you have $150 billion, which is more money than many countries have. Capitalism produces extremes of inequality. That is a terrible flaw in the system, which no amount of justification could ever excuse. The argument that I usually hear is, oh, well, the person is more confident to make important decisions that not everybody else wants to make. He or she has more expertise. And therefore, just like in a hierarchy of 
the animal kingdom, the strongest gets the biggest piece of the pie. It should be applied to the same way in our social system. Um, so, and now we are realizing, I think we were talking about this off camera, the values of uh, people that are working at Amazon or working uh, as nurses and working in supermarkets. So could you address this argument about um, whether expertise, confidence and all of those things really merit uh, so much value and why now uh, the nurses and other people that are working as essential workers are being valued so much in our society and not before? Yeah, I love the analogy with the animal kingdom and hierarchy in the animals. If we're going to use the animals as a model, then I think we should justify a cannibalism. We should go and eat the poor, or we should go and, and do all the other things that animals do. You know, one kind of society prides itself that it has gotten beyond animals. It tells you something about a society that is so destroyed, so poor in its morality, that it looks to the animals as a model for what they ought to do. It, it's, it's evolution in reverse uh, that's being suggested. And I don't think that's, that's really serious. Um, we also have demonstrations of people who have become billionaires who are clearly unqualified to do anything. Uh, we are in the United States. We're currently led by a president who is a billionaire and has proven to us over and over again that being smart has nothing to do with being a billionaire, uh, that billionaires are capable of doing some of the grossest, stupidest, ignorant, you name it. Only now it's in a position that's, that's really very dangerous for us. So, no, I think the argument that the, uh, uh, that the people who are rich somehow do more uh, has always been uh, fake. Uh, I, could, I could tell you my own experience because uh, I'm a product of the elite schools in the United States where the children of the rich go to school. Uh, I went to Harvard. Then I went to Stanford in California, and I ended up at Yale. All right. So those are arguably among the, the 10 fanciest, ritziest school. Most of my classmates, particularly at Harvard, were the children of very wealthy people who were there because they were the children of very wealthy people. They weren't the smartest people in the room. They weren't the smartest people in their schools. Not at all. The only ones who might have claimed that they were the smartest in the room were people like me who got there even though we didn't have any money, even though our parents had no income because we performed well on the tests that were required to, to get in. But most of my classmates who had gone to private schools that were also very expensive and very prestigious. I don't know if you know these names, but Exeter and Andover and all of the others. Um, there was a, there's a, a system in this country, which everybody should understand, in which the rec rich people take a lot of steps to ensure that their children get every advantage imaginable from the time they are born until they complete their university education. They are given tutorials. They are allowed to travel. They are given help whenever they need it. They are given psychological counseling if and when they need it. They get the best medical care. By the time they get to college, it's already over. They're already in the track to become the next generation of the wealthiest people. There is no way for them to ever know that they are one whit smarter than anybody else because there's never been at any point in their life any kind of comparison, any kind of test between them and those without the money to determine who uh, is the better bet to go to the university, who will make the better scientist or doctor or teacher or lawyer or whatever you want. This is all done in a tracking system in which those who are the richest get the majority of positions. Are there a few 
people who are not rich who can climb in? Yes, there always are a few. But the argument that those who get the big money are in some sense more equipped, more skilled, more it's just not true. It's just a, an attempt to make it reasonable uh, because it is fundamentally so unreasonable that you have to come up with these kinds of thinly, quickly developed rationales. I want to switch gear here and talk about the bigger picture in terms of economics, um, the implications of COVID-19. Governments have responded with massive stimulus packages, benefits, and even laws have been implemented that have redirected investment and production into the health sector. In Germany, for example, small and medium-sized businesses are being helped out. In Spain, the UBI, Universal Basic Income, is being passed. I've heard that in the US, a check of $1,200 for a couple of weeks have been given. Uh, how do you assess the economic implications and do the response of governments go far enough to address this crisis? The, the response of the governments is uh, almost in every case too little and too late. But I will call, focus on the United States because that's what I know best. Uh, the response here is somewhere between absurd and disgusting. And let me explain uh, the Federal Reserve is pumping trillions of dollars into the economy, basically by making money available. Uh, and the U.S. Treasury is doing what we call fiscal policy by pumping two and a half trillion dollars uh, of money that they will have to borrow in order to spend more than they take in in taxes. Uh, and it may be more than that. Here's the fundamental problem. This money is being given to, overwhelmingly, to employers. A very important to understand. Large employers, small employers, and medium employers. Most of that money is being given to them, and they are being told, uh, please do what is socially useful, whatever that means. In a in a few cases, they are being told, you cannot do this with the money, but you must do that with the money. But it is very easy, if you have ever been in the position of owning and operating a business, to move the money around uh, to accommodate for what the giver government gives you by using money you would have used for that, for something else, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The problem with our economic collapse is the decisions made by employers, is what got us into this mess in the first place. It is bizarre, bizarre, to respond to the failure of the decision-making apparatus of capitalism by giving untold amounts of money to the same decision-making apparatus. That means you have learned nothing. And let me drive it home this way. The current collapse of capitalism in the United States is the third crash of capitalism in the 21st century. In the spring of 2000, we had what came to be called the dot-com crisis. In 2008 and 9, we had what came to be called the subprime mortgage crisis. And now we have the corona crisis. Well, it's interesting that the people who want to defend capitalism always name the crisis for something that started it as if the capitalist system is a kind of pure victim of an external crash. This is, if you pardon my crude English, what we call here bullshit. It is nonsense. Let me explain. The dot-com crisis happened because the, the stock prices of, of dot-com companies were crazy. These were companies who had never made any profit, but whose stock price was very high. Was this the first time that the stock market had stocks that were irrationally high? No, that's at least three centuries old. The price of tulips in England in the 1720 uh, was too high for the market. 
Same thing in 2008 and 9. We have had periods of time where significant numbers of people borrowed money to buy homes, mortgages, which they then could not pay. So the, the capitalism has had that problem many times. And as I told you before, this is not the first virus uh, dangerous to human beings that we have had. Uh, in, in 1918, we had what we call the Spanish flu here in the United States. Uh, it killed 700,000 people, which at that time, that would be a disaster now. But then when the country was much smaller, it was a much bigger disaster. So we know that in each case, we either are ready and we can overcome it, which we've done, or we aren't ready and we can't overcome it. But this crisis is at least as much a result of the vulnerability of capitalism, of the failure of our economic system, as it is uh, the result of whatever this time triggered. It's a difference between a trigger and a collapse. A healthy body can handle the coronavirus. If you look at who dies from the coronavirus, you will very often discover people whose physical situation wasn't very good in the first place. Had it been better, they would at least have had a better chance to survive. That's true of our economic system uh, as well. So for me, uh, here's what I see. After the dot-com crisis in the spring of 2000, the Federal Reserve pumped money into the economy and lowered interest rates. As a result, by 2008, vast numbers of people had taken advantage of the extra money and the low interest rate to borrow to buy a home they could not afford. And the system had built a whole structure of credit based on those mortgages. But that meant that if the mortgages couldn't get paid, uh, the system would fall apart. Okay, after 2008 and 9, here's what they did. They threw a huge amount of money at the economy. They did then pretty much what they are doing now. The real only difference is they're doing more of it now. It's a bigger financial package. But once again, they dropped interest rates to literally to zero in Europe, below zero, you've even had. And of course, here's what happened. Over the last 10 years, every business in the United States, small, large, and medium, have solved every economic problem that arose when they chose the wrong investment, when they didn't buy the right technology, when they... Uh, hired incompetent people, whatever the problem, there was always the easiest, cheapest way to solve the problem was to borrow limitless amounts of money at virtually no interest. Every corporation did it. So by the time the coronavirus hit us, we had the most enormous level of corporate debt in the history of American capitalism. So, of course, the minute you have a significant number of people who need to save their lives by not going to work, then nobody can pay the enormous mountain of debt. It's literally that in the United States, the capitalist response to the dot-com crisis in 2000 set the stage to produce the crisis in 2008. And the steps taken to do that set up the crisis of 2020 and the policies being imposed now learn nothing from those two sequences, are continuing to do exactly the same thing, putting huge amounts of money into the hands of the tiny minority of the population that are employers, the vast majority are employees. And that will lead to the same sequence, the same disaster, only bigger, because each of these gets bigger. It is irrationality uh, on a 
stupefying scale. One last point. The, just to give you the arithmetic, the median income of an American household is about $60,000. That works out to about $1,200 a week. Okay? The government, which has shut down most workplaces for about a month now, has decided to give workers who have not earned money for a month $1,200. That's the equivalent of one week. We are now being told that most jobs will not open until at least May 15th. Okay, so that would mean something on the order of eight weeks without income. And they're giving everybody one week's worth of income. The amount of money being given to average people is an insult. And the amount of money being given to employers, again, is, is, makes the insult even worse. So I, I want to, again, pick up the neoliberal argument here. And I apologize if I do, but I think it's for the sake of objectivity. Uh, I think it's quite important. The argument would be if you hand out money uh, to just people, um, it would increase the money supply, whereas the production of goods and services that employers, uh, facilities and businesses produce is rolling back. And if the money supply increases in the hands of people, whereas the production of goods and services is rolling back, that could lead to inflation or hyperinflation. And another argument that I usually hear is that giving money to, um, they usually call this a uh, demand supply, uh, a demand side economy. Uh, 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 could you correct me on this? It's called demand. Uh, uh, demand side and supply side, that's right. Yeah, and if you give it to local people, it will go into unproductive hands. Um, so could you address these two arguments, A, whether hyperinflation is coming soon, um, and B, whether these policies are now uh, going to increase uh, not efficiency, but at the contrary, will diminish efficiency and productivity? Um, giving money to people who are already rich in, the, in an argument that this will eventually lead to production and jobs and incomes. That has a name in the United States. It's called trickle-down economics, okay? Is it possible that that happens? Yes. But of course, it depends on what the people to whom you give the money do with it. So let's give you an example. We know the answer. After 2008, huge amounts of money were given to businesses. Here's what they did with it. They bought back shares of their own stock in the stock market. That drove up the price of stocks, which for the shareholders was wonderful. And it was wonderful for the executives who did it too, because their pay is tied to the value of the stocks. This was not a, an increase of efficiency, and this didn't create any jobs at all. It just produced an inflation, but in a very controlled part of the economy, namely the stock market. All of that extra money pumped into the economy by politicians who told us about the jobs it would create, discovered that it didn't, that what it did was to create an extraordinary stock market boom, an inflation of the stock market starting in 2009 and 10 which had the following effects. Inequality went crazy because the minority that owned shares was looking like wonderful and everybody else was suffering. Because the political class is coming from the same people who own the shares, they were able to say, see, isn't the recovery wonderful? Mr. Trump goes around the country telling people it's a great economy. It never was. It was only that the inflation had been concentrated in the stock market, which, by the way, collapsed over the last three weeks because it was sitting on nothing. The alternative economic policy is not trickled down, 
but trickle up the opposite. That's when you give money to all the mass of people and we know what they do. They immediately spend the money. They buy more food, they buy more clothing, they use it for their transportation, they use it for their amusements. They go out and they spend the money. The reason we know that is they don't have any savings anyway. They didn't have any savings before. They're not going to have any savings now. You're very, very confident as an economist that given money to the bottom two thirds of the income distribution will get you a surge of, say, uh, of spending. And what we hope that spending will do, but I, let me underscore the word hope. We hope the spending will lead the storekeepers of the society, the merchants, to respond to all that extra money being spent by ordering more goods to be sold for that extra money, thereby putting people to work producing those goods. But in a free enterprise system, capitalism, the merchant is allowed to respond to the extra money in people's hands by raising the price rather than uh, uh, getting more goods and services. In that case, you have a general price inflation. But the reason for that is not that the government prints money. That's simply misunderstanding how an economy works. The reason you have an inflation is how capitalists react to the extra money in people's hands, if you control that, which by the way, desperate capitalist societies have done in the past, that's called a price control. We had that in 1971 here in the United States. President at the time, Richard Nixon said, very important, and you've had it in Europe and, and Asia too. As of tomorrow morning at eight o'clock, if you're a merchant and you raise your price, we're going to arrest you and put you in jail. You cannot do that. Well, that's a way to do it because you know what that means? Then the merchant can only respond to the money coming in the front door by having more goods to sell, and that's what he will do. So the, the, the answer is the government of the United States has simply done what it did before. It didn't recognize the failure before. It hopes for the same outcome now, but it will be more difficult and more painful for the mass of people. But the whole idea is to get the stock market booming again, because that is the way these crazy people think you deal with this problem. And because everyone's a politician for five years, by the time this disaster unfolds, Mr. Trump will be an old man and out of office, and a new set of politicians will come in and in, in all likelihood do the same thing. You mentioned price controls, and here is, again, I when I talk to people, they say if we have controls, whether it's price controls or any sort of control, it can lead to a strong state. And usually, for example, if Trump comes into power, or we're just seeing now with Viktor Orban, uh, during this crisis from Hungary, they pass sweeping powers which uh, um, disempower the parliament. And so do you think it's actually a good suggestion to have these forms of controls and give government power when we know politics can change and lead to authoritarianism? No, but for me, the way that I, I would rewrite your story a little bit in the history of capitalism. The crises produced by that system tend to be resolved in a way that perpetuates the system. And when they can't do that, then they turn to the fascists and bring them into power. There would have been no Hitler without the German business community bringing him into power in, the, in January of 1933. Nobody else did. Not to forget uh, the... A harsh austerity that created the conditions uh, after World War I uh, in Germany. Absolutely. And the inflation that wiped out the middle class in 1923. But capitalism has this wonderful ability to, to 
work its way into a crisis over and over again. I've told you about the three we've already had in the first 20 years of this century. And then to say, gee, you can't uh, have a different approach because if you do, we'll get another Hitler. You're bringing the Hitler. The socialists didn't bring Mr. Hitler. The socialists aren't bringing um, Viktor Orban or Mr. Trump. That Those are the enemies of socialism. My answer is, you're not going to prevent the, the concentration of power in the hands of a dictator under the capitalist system, because capitalism produces the crises that create the opportunities for that kind of dictatorial power. If they were to do now a price control, you're absolutely right. That would be even more power for the government, which we know will use it to reproduce capitalism because it's been doing that all along. You have to have a program that changes things everywhere in society. The response is to recognize that this isn't a pandemic from a virus. This is a failure of an economic system, and the solution is to change the system. And one of the ways I would advocate, you know this about me, is that we recognize that what socialism should have had on the agenda but didn't was to transform the workplace, to stop a, a system in which a tiny minority employers make all the key decisions about what happens in each enterprise. And because they have that power, because they dispense with the profits, they decide what to do with them, they're responsible for the system working the way it is. To democratize the enterprise creates power in the mass of people at the base of society, and that's the best chance we have to prevent the consolidation of fascistic power at the top. So I could already imagine an argument on uh, democracy at work. Um, that would be this crisis. Obviously, we can talk about context and stuff like that uh, to create good conditions. But if we just take this crisis into account, just imagine for a second and that in a hospital, uh, the, the chief uh, in charge would have to go to all of his nurses and doctors and say, hey, let's now decide upon how to do it. I mean, when you have patients coming in, uh, at a rate of hundreds and thousands a day, how would that effectively work if we just try to put it in practical terms? How would okay. you counter that? Okay, let me react honestly with you. There's something fun, and I know you don't mean this, but there's something fundamentally insulting here. A group of medical professionals, nurses, doctors, you name it, they are smart committed people. They can figure out how to handle different moments in the practice of their skill and their profession. If you are under the gun and people are flooding into your clinic who are desperately sick, here's what you would do because you're not stupid. You would say, okay, if under these circumstances, decisions have to be made quickly by people who understand what's going on. So we're going to institute this kind of hierarchy. You, who've had 20 years of experience, are going to have more power than you who arrived here last week. And that's not because you're valuable and you aren't. It's, it's a rational way to deal with a situation. By the same token, when you are not under the gun, when you are deciding what to order to have in your stockpile. You need to know what the nurse and the orderly, because they have a better sense of how often you use a napkin or a swab or a piece of wood and how easy it is to lose them or to have them lose their sterility. You need everybody involved, even the people who clean up so they can help you. How would we clean up if we were suddenly flooded with people? You know, you need everybody. You don't want the doctor at the top to be discussing toilet paper. And you don't want the toilet paper specialist to be. But the people who work there, they know best who has what skill. 
not just who has what credential, but who has shown himself or herself to be very effective in a difficult situation, who has a greater skill with blood issues than with bone issues. These are things that are known by the group. And if you don't establish an artificial hierarchy, it's insulting to think that we need some economist. I'm one. It's ridiculous. I'm not competent to make that decision that the doctor should always be in charge. That's stupid. There are times when that doctor shouldn't be in charge, when other people need to have a voice equal to or greater than his because they have the expertise, the experience, and a collective of people would understand that, would do it, would explain to the doctor if his if his uh, feelings were hurt, look, you're a wonderful doctor in these and these and these circumstances, but not in the other one. And we now need the other one. And the nurse over there is the person we're going to give that job to. Richard, what most people don't understand is the decision making power has not only transferred away from the chief of hospitals or doctors, the people who are at the workplace, but financialization has had a huge influence, shareholders or board of directors, which have in most cases not even visited the hospital and are sitting somewhere in New York or Frankfurt and have huge hedge funds controlling the operations, the way how much people are paid in hospitals. Can you talk about how financialization has affected the healthcare system? Yeah, it's the, in a sense, it's the peaking, if you like, of the capitalist system. Uh, the small, think of it this way, the small capitalist in a village somewhere who has a dozen employees, sure, he is under the gun of the profit system. He has to make his enterprise pay. He has to bring in more revenue than he shells out in costs. But we all know that he also lives in the same village where his workers do. And he has to see them in the street and their children play with his children. And maybe he's in the same church that they go to. And so he will make decisions sometimes that are not profit maximizing because he has to live with the results of his decisions. Another way to say this in economics is that the profit is not, in fact, his bottom line. It is only one of several bottom lines, and that he, as a decision maker, is more or less swayed by one or the other of these bottom lines, depending on the social context. Okay, when you get to a hedge fund, uh, office in Frankfurt or Paris or New York, uh, these people are no longer in the village and they are no longer small businesses. They do nothing but maximize profit. They really are the textbook example of capitalism concretely realized. Everything they look at is subjected to one underlying objective, maximize profit, make the re rate of return on invested capital maximum. They get rewarded if they do that, and they get punished or lose their job if they don't do it. And so what it means is we've reached a point in capitalism where the more and more of the decisions are made by people who have only profit as their bottom line, and fewer and fewer decisions are made by capitalists who have to include a variety of other objectives as part of their goals. That's why I advocate worker co-ops, because I want explicitly to have enterprises operated with multiple different bottom lines which means I am interested in an enterprise that consistently loses money, that, that has higher costs and revenues, because in the long run, that's a problem. 
but I am equally concerned with an enterprise that provides no security to its workers, who can't have the, the life that says, I am confident that I will have a job and an income six months from now, a year from now, so that I can buy a house, or that I can work with my child to go to the university, uh, because I will be able to help pay for that. For me, a worker co-op will have explicitly you will be able to survive and grow if you can show that you provided a more secure job than the next one. That will have to be weighed against you may have gotten a lower profit rate, but you accomplished this other objective. In other words, we don't make you live or die on the one criterion of profit. I would argue that that has produced the very weaknesses, the very vulnerabilities of capitalism, so that this alternative is a better response to the needs of the people in an economy than the crazy capitalism, which has now reached the point of literally making one criterion. And you know, in popular culture, this is understood. Here in the United States, we have a phrase, the almighty dollar. When people are driven no longer by the complexity of life, but simply by earning money, we say they have been captured by the almighty dollar. The word almighty being a reference to God or Allah or whoever you, you believe in. The point being, it's religious, it's fanatical, it's fundamentalist. And people understand that just like a human being becomes distorted if all he or she cares about is making money, if that's true for the individual, it is also true for those collections of individuals we call enterprises. I want to talk about globalization, concepts such as just in time or all the supply chains uh, that use this concept are now freezing. A uh, lot of organizations are realizing the value of local and regional production. Could you talk about globalization briefly, just to introduce it to the concept to our um, viewers, and also talk about whether you think that uh, in the future capitalists will see this, or even responsible business people will see this as a way of saying, okay, we cannot have supply chains going uh, to China or Bangladesh and stuff like that. Well, it's interesting that you have arranged the sequence of questions this way. I would use the immediately preceding conversation to explain this. Globalization was simply the decision of the profit-crazed people uh, to make the most profit. And if you can buy something more cheaply from Shanghai than you can from Cincinnati, that's what you do. All of the other dimensions of this decision are of no interest to you because you are a profit-crazed maximizer. You know who has understood this very well? The ecological movement. Because basically what the environmentalists have been saying is what I'm saying, but in a more narrow way. You shouldn't just maximize profit, you should minimize carbon footprint or you should minimize global warming, or in other words, they are, without knowing it, they are saying you should have an additional bottom line, and sometimes you should go this way rather than maximize profit. When you create a global uh, supply chain, you are not counting the effect on the environment. If a, polit if a part is produced in uh, Cincinnati, but it's more expensive than one in China, and you shift to the one in China, you are now going to have to transport that thing produced in China 10,000 miles across the ocean in a ship that pollutes the water, that pollutes the air, that burns fossil fuel, uh, blah, 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 blah. And that's going to have consequences you might be concerned about those consequences. 
And if you are, for example, pollution, well, then you can't make a decision to have a global chain simply calculating the profit because that excludes the other objectives. Yeah, but I would go further. Suppose there's a pandemic and a long distance chain is no longer workable. You're then not going to have the means to save the lives of your people. Then the irrationality becomes overwhelming. And that's what we're seeing. The swabs, you know, the long stem things that they put in your nose to determine whether you have the coronavirus. Most of those for the world were made in a factory in the north of Italy. When the virus hit Italy, and Italy has been very badly hit, they stopped producing those swabs, and we don't have them. And that's a very serious problem. Often, when people say to you, we can't give you a corona test, they have everything but the swab. Okay, it was crazy for the Italians to have only one place. It was crazy for the Europeans to rely on the one place in Italy. And it was even crazier for the United States to rely on the one factory in, in Italy. That decision, though, is not because people don't plan. That's a misunderstanding. That's a decision that is made as a direct consequence of the logic of capitalism. You maximize profit, and then you rely on the ideologues, the neoliberal ideologues, if you like, to spend a mountain of paper, a mountain of, of audio and video to persuade the world that optimizing or maximizing profit by some magic maximizes everybody's well-being. This, Adam Smith understood this problem when he made the metaphor of the invisible hand. If every one of us pursues our own self-interest, we don't have to worry that it blows the society up because it will, we will all be led as if by an invisible hand to the best outcome for everybody. That is crazy. That is the effort of somebody who's hit a problem in the logic of their thinking, can't figure out a solution, and so lapses into Jesus will take care of it or Allah will take care of it. I understand people's frustration ending up in that kind of logic. But if you want to practically solve the problems of life, you have to put that away. Capitalism is a religious economic system. Instead of God and Allah, it has profit maximizing. It leads to the same dead end. Switching to US domestic politics, um, um, right now, Bernie Sanders uh, endorsed Joe Biden. Even figures on the left like Noam Chomsky have said that uh, Joe Biden's um, presidency could potentially have more channels of democracy and uh, public participation, which could influence policy. Uh, while on the other, the left is split, which says we are done with the voting of lesser two evils. How do you see this perspective, this reformist perspective? I, I'm rephrasing here. I, I think it's a reformist perspective. Um, do you see Chomsky's view as being um, a way that we can, through Biden, still influence policy and have more channels like trade unions and nurses unions available to influence policy? Or do, are, you, are you completely avoiding this debate about, and you see both Biden and Trump as part of the same coin? Um, no, and I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I don't phrase it quite that way. Uh, let me respond. I'm very disappointed that Bernie uh, withdrew from the race, and I'm even more di disappointed that he endorsed Biden. Um, Biden is better than Trump. That seems clear to me, uh, but it's almost meaningless because that's such a low bar that the statement is, is sort of boring. Almost anybody would have been better than Trump. Certainly any one of the 20 people 
who at various times said they wanted to be president of the Democratic Party would have been better than Trump. And they, who cares? Yes, it's better than Trump. And when it comes to voting, yeah, I suppose we'll vote for Biden. I mean, who is, no one's going to vote for Trump uh, for 20 different reasons. But for the left, uh, Mr. Biden is, is a zero. There's nothing there. Is what we call an empty suit. This is a an old, probably senile representative of an old, certainly senile establishment uh, of the Democratic Party. This is the Clintons. This is Obama, um, and this is all the old apparatchiks of the Democratic Party who are terrified by by Bernie, um, who take money from the corporate elite who are, you know, the center left um, in, a, in a game with the center right. So for me, the job of the left is what it was before. Only I, I appreciate Bernie because he strengthened us. He did two things. Number one, he taught millions of Americans that they are not alone and that they are not isolated. He taught them and he taught the whole world that there's an enormous constituency for anti-capitalism and for socialism, whatever the vague understanding of those terms, and it is vague. But he taught the world that the United States is not the place where there can't be socialism. That is an enormous step forward for us. He also made the daily conversation about socialism acceptable, which, speaking very personally, has opened the door for people like me in a way that did not exist in the totality of my lifetime here in the United States. So I, I feel an enormous debt to Bernie, even though I disagree with and am disappointed by his decisions. But he built a foundation that we ought to be building on now. For the time being, those of us who want to build a la Bernie, a kind of moderate socialism within the Democratic Party, I say, fine, do it. And for those of us who want to build outside the Democratic Party, build an alternative socialist party that can be much more aggressive, much more explicit, much go much further, I say, do it. My activity will be with the second group, personally, not the first one. I'm not interested in building it inside the Democratic Party. But I understand there are many people who are, and I would advise those and those that I'm with, the ones who want to build independently, that people change over time. And we need a movement that welcomes people who want to do it in the Democratic Party, just like we should welcome people who don't. And we should understand that the, the problems that will be given by the old established Democrats to those like Bernie or Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or the others like that, there will be movement of those people. And if they get disappointed by the Democratic Party, their commitment to socialism will bring them to us. And we have to welcome that. We have to make that as easy a process as possible. Uh, and I would be, I would remind Americans, I don't need to do it with your audience, uh, the, the d Linka party is a merger of a wing of the SPD and of the old East Europe, the Eastern German. And that kind of an alliance can also emerge in this country between the socialist wing of the Democratic Party and the independent uh, socialism that is emerging. So to my last question, and this will also be the title of this video, is COVID-19 the end of capitalism or the revival of socialism? There's a joke here in the United States that we Marxists are very proud that we predicted 10 of the last four crises. Uh, so I don't want to get into the business. I, I don't know uh, how, where, or when capitalism will crash. Um, 
I can tell you this, uh, and this is a perspective I share with economists in the middle and on the right. This is the worst condition of capitalism in the United States in our lifetimes. And we were saying that before the COVID crisis emerged, and now we pat ourselves on the back, we saw it coming. We could see that the inequality being generated here in the United States by capitalism was unsustainable. We could see that the ecological collapse, I don't know if you saw it, this morning was announced the worst drought in the West part of the United States in our history as a nation. I mean, we cannot continue. We, we have ecological unsustainability. We have inequality unsustainability. And we now have instability unsustainability. The third crash in 20 years is making it easier for me to explain to people that the problem isn't dot-com prices or unpaid mortgages or some virus. It's the problem of a system that can't prepare. Here's, here's the, the punchline I'm going to end with. The only reason we didn't have in the United States a stockpile of tests, vests, gloves, masks, ventilators, hospitals, and beds was because it wasn't privately profitable to produce them and to stockpile them in warehouses across the country. So they would be where the population centers were. They would be ready and available. They would be monitored every six months to make sure they weren't disintegrating, that they were sterile and clean and all the rest. The only reason we didn't have that is that private companies here in the United States who have all the tools, equipment necessary to produce them, who have all the workers necessary to produce them, we have all the warehouses necessary to stockpile them. Capitalism, profit, that's why we didn't produce it. And because the government is a neoliberal government completely controlled by private capitalism, they believe that the private profit motive is the royal road to prosperity and well-being. So instead of coming in to compensate for the failure of the private capitalist system, they became instead complicit with it. So they didn't have the stockpiles either. And so we have tens of thousands of people dead, an entire economy flat on its feet because we, and this is not a critique of Mr. Trump, he's the least important. We didn't have what, was it, what should have been available. And on top of it, we had a government that could not ideologically compensate for this failure because it's in bed with capital. The problem that's being exposed in this country is the problem of an economic system that doesn't work. And in the long run, we may well look back upon this moment as when that became clear. And in that, one final point. In the 14th century, you had an exhausted feudalism. And suddenly, Rats who had fleas brought with them a plague, which came to be known as the Black Death or the Bubonic Plague. It killed a third of all of Europe in that time, the worst plague in human history that we know of. Here's the interesting thing. It was deadly because feudalism had exhausted people. But the, but the impact back upon feudalism of the Black Death was the end of feudalism. The system that can't handle a virus usually dies. That's the lesson. Capitalism is not handling this, and that's not good for the future of capitalism. But in that, I am not going to cry. I am rather going to cheer. Richard Wolf, author, economist, and the co-founder of Democracy at Work, thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And please send us a link 
we will definitely post it and promote it. And thank you guys for tuning in today. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking on the bell below and to donate so we can continue to produce independent and non-profit news and analysis. My name is Zan Raza. See you guys next time.